Mike Owens here. Did I enjoy buying New Mansa? Joaquin Buckley, who's coming off another crazy big win in his career over North Sultan mm-hmm. Rosie Boev. Joaquin, great to sit down and chat. How things are you today? Hey man, how you doing though, bro? Uh yeah, I'm I'm ecstatic that I got this win. Uh we definitely needed it. Uh definitely, you know, coming into my hometown, uh being there with my family and friends. And, you know, they I had a big task in front of me, but I think we aced it. <laughs> I checked your record before we jumped on, and the last time you'd fought in St. Louis was 2016. So nearly yeah. 10 years, 10 years since you'd fought in your hometown. So what was the whole experience like, specifically the return to home? Uh, I mean, the experience was was great because this is what I've been waiting on. You know, I've been waiting on this moment to come back to my hometown and, and show out in front of uh, almost a sold-out crowd, right? Mm. And uh, we broke the attendance record. So... Everybody been waiting for me to come back to, you know, my city and kind of uh, do what I do best. So, you know, it felt great, man, doing, you know, what I love to do in front of my people. We were on the ground and we were chatting in Vegas when you were campaigning for that main event slot. But you obviously got yeah. the co-main. Were you satisfied with that? Was it just the case of being on that card was was of prime it importance was really, to you? It was really the case of being on the card. Of course, you got to shoot for the stars. And if you shoot for the stars, you might land on the moon. Mm-hmm. So that's exactly what we did. So getting the co-main is just as major. Uh, than being, you know, uh, a main event. But, you know, Derek Lewis is obviously, you know, a big name. So I, I got some work to do. That's all. Mm-hmm. Um, You may have seen in Dana's post-fight, in t- post-fight press comments that it, it was only the second time the UFC had been to St. Louis, which surprised me. But Dana's come out and said that they'll, they'll definitely be returning. I presume at that point you start uh, yeah, prepping for no the main choice. event. Yes, sir. They ain't got no choice but to show up again just because, like I said, we broke a record. Their attendance record, you know, um, I think uh, we made the most uh, when it comes to a UFC fight night. So with that being said, you know, uh, the numbers speak for themselves and the UFC has no other choice but to, you know, make a couple trips to St. Louis again. <laughs> so second time for St. Louis and a couple of times we'll see the only the second time in history for Louisville, Kentucky. So it seems to be the UFC are starting to target these new areas. Is there an area that they maybe haven't hit yet that you would like to fight? Uh, not that I know of, you know, other than that, man, I, I, I just really want to focus on where I'm from in St. Louis and try to bring the UFC down here as, as many times as possible, right? At least three times a year. That'd be dope. I, uh, I caught up with Charles last week, Charles Johnson. What was it like sharing the card with, with your teammate and good friend? Uh, that's my brother, you know, so it, it was good. Um, impactful because, you know, we all got to win. Uh, not just Charles, but Sean Wilson. So all the guys that are from St. Louis, you know, the people that I have history with that, you know, I seen from the bottom. Now we all at the on the biggest promotion on the planet. Uh, it was good, man. It felt good, bro. It just felt like some movie type shit. <laughs> Let's talk about the win, as I mentioned, because, you know, it was a, it was a big task, literally, literally in terms of the opponent, the size of the opponent. Yeah, he was the fighting. tallest. I think he uh, recorded the tallest what the weight. Uh, mm-hmm. fighter, you know, uh, not just in the division, but in history, which is yeah. crazy. <laughs> How do you break down the win? A very, very impressive performance over a very tough competitor. Uh, you know, well, breaking down not just you know the win itself, but I, I feel like you know doing my homework and and seeing what you know um, Nurse Tom was good at. I, I felt like that I had great advantages because the people that he was fighting didn't have the same experience uh, as me. Now he did a great job of you know, uh, getting those guys out of there by either submitting them or knocking them out. But at the same time, you know, you messing with guys that are very green in the game. I couldn't see Nurse Tom doing the same thing to me in the first round. And my biggest thing was how will he perform in the second and the third? And, you know, I seen a lot of other good fights that, you know, really kind of exposed them uh, Mm -hmm. when the fight kind of went the distance. And I knew that I could do the same thing. So, you know, with all that being said, I knew exactly what was going to happen that night. So, you know, when I got that win, you know, everything just came into fruition. I was going to ask about that because I think of that 10 fight win streak he was on, I want to say all or maybe nine of the 10 were first round stoppages. So in your mind and looking at the tape, was the game plan to take him, take it long and take him into those deep waters? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that that's the real test, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we know you're dangerous in the first round, so why play with you there? Let's see if you're still dangerous in the second and the third. And my, my biggest thing is, you know, a lot of guys, everybody got power in the first round. I mean, every single fighter. Uh, but, you know, the, the longer the fight goes, the the more people tend to slow down. Mm-hmm. For me, I feel like it's different. And that's why I want to test myself with a main event. 
because I really want to know what it feels like to go five rounds before I even, you know, shoot for a title, if that makes sense. Yeah. Let me know if I'm even prepared to even do that, right? A lot of guys, they want that opportunity to fight for a title, but motherfucker, you can't even go three rounds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, test yourself first before you try to call out or try to get your shot at a, uh, at a title. Speaking of going 15 minutes, it felt like the finish was close in the third when you wobbled him, and specifically with some of that ground and pounds. I mean, you all know better than anybody how close were you to getting out of getting him out of there? Uh, he was he was hurt. He was hurt. I, I really feel like uh Peterson should have ended ended the fight. Keith Peterson should have ended the fight for sure. I mean, you seen when I fought Vicente Luque, he ended it. But that's the thing, Vicente was covering up the whole time, mm. so I'd even hurt Vicente, but he stopped the fight then. Mm. So for him to let the fight go on while my man was taking a lot of damage and getting beat up on, uh, you know, I don't know. I think I think the fight should have been stopped way before, you know. I have to ask you this because obviously we've met up in person. I spent a little bit of time with you in Las Vegas. You you had to go very quickly for your for your lift, I think it was, to go yeah, and catch, yeah, catch yeah. your posters. <laughs> But you've what I love about you and what I love about chatting about you is you really seem to enjoy the each moment of fight week. You enjoy the press you enjoy the press day, you enjoy the press conference, you enjoy the weigh-ins, you enjoy the water, the cage, and you enjoy the time in the in the in the actual fight. How how are you able to stay so present and enjoy all parts of fight week and the fight specifically? Oh, that's a good question, bro. Because to be honest with you, there was a time where I thought this shit would never happen for me again. I thought, you know, once, you know, I got cut from Bellator and, you know, I had that loss against Logan Storley um, and I, I couldn't find a fight. I couldn't get myself back into the cage where I needed to be, where I wanted to be. I thought that shit was over. So now that I'm back and now that I'm actually, you know, a surgeon in my career, I want to soak up every moment because eventually this shit ain't never going to happen again. Right. Um, you know, the older we get, you know, the more of the reality that is that we're not going to be able to fight yeah. anymore. Right. But that, that should always be the goal. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's to move on. But once I move on, you know, people tend to have those memories in their head and be like, damn, I wish I did this. Damn, I wish I did that. I'm not going to be one of those ones. So every moment, like you said before, I live it up to the fullest, man. And I just soak it in. Where does this moment rank in terms of the best of your career? I mean, you have one of the best knockouts in UFC history. The last time out prior to this, you get your top your top 15 ranking, which I'm sure was a big moment. And then to come back and co-headline in your home to, um, yeah, city. Yeah. Where does where does this rank in terms of the biggest moment and the most special in your career? Uh I mean it, it ranks up there high. It ranks up there high. I can't I can't lie. Uh but every moment has a special, you know, meaning to me. Uh, whether you're talking about it's the 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 knockout over uh Empire Saginaw, that was the 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 kick that really get my name out there and exposed the world of who I am. Getting into the top fifteen where people can really see my ability, you know, what I mean, to working towards the title. Me coming back home and being around, you know, my loved ones and, and fighting in front of my family. Uh, so you know, each one has its own, you know, uh, close, you know. Uh, enduring feelings for me but regardless though I feel like the only moment that's going to be the most impactful of my career is getting a world title yeah. that's it that's the end all goal and once I do that uh, obviously that's going to be the highest of the highs <laughs> I have to ask because there was a, a video that came out on fight week I think with uh, between yourself and some Uzbekistani fans I'm not sure if they were yeah. part of Ruzaboev's team but I have to ask what was on the phone because when that guy showed showed you his phone, <laughs> your face dropped. I have to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he showed me his bank account that he had. He has a couple, you know, zeros on there. But I don't know if it was Uzbek money <laughs> <laughs> or American dollars. But either way, it's a lot of money he had on there. <laughs> yeah. Where Where are you at with Rizaboa? Because I've saw. Um, Joe Pfeiffer and Sean Brady on their podcast were saying some less than uh, less than nice things about you. I think they were saying something about they could smell you right, right. your jeans or something like that. Yeah. I mean, where, <laughs> yeah, where's that? Have, have we got a be have we got a team beef there? What's going on? Oh uh, no, nah, it will no, nah, it's never that. Well, me and Nurse Tom, we we split we uh spilt blood in that cage, and I feel like if we're able to do that, we blood brothers, right? Yeah. We was able to put on the show. Um, we mark our names and history together, so. I have no problems with uh, him at all uh, because he came in and he is the reason why I was able to fight 
that night in my hometown city. So it's nothing but respect and love for him. And obviously, uh, for me, I would love to go to Uzbekistan. And if he can, you know what I'm saying, show me around, that'd be a beautiful moment, right? Uh, but for his teammates, Joe Pfeiffer and Sean Brady, you know, they 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 talking on me bad because they seeing where my light is, right? Right now, they not shining how they feel like they should have been with Sean Brady had once been undefeated. Joe Pfeiffer being that, uh, you know, be like Joe Pfeiffer. They ain't got that light on them right now. So now that they see that light on me and I'm shining, they trying to dim it. But it's all good, though. You you can't stop what's destined for me at the end of the day. I feel like attitudes have changed you, OG Buck, if I'm honest. Like, I feel like when you were doing your thing at middleweight, people said kind of had a limit on where they thought you could take things. And then now you've moved down to 170. And I feel like not only have you have you become a bigger star with what, the way you speak on the mic and the way that you put yourself out there, but people really believe that you can do something in this 170 pound division. Do you feel like people's attitudes have changed towards your, your where you can um, take Maybe, maybe not, right? Mm. My attitude towards myself has changed. And that's the only thing that matters. So as long as I keep doing what I'm doing, which I will continue to do what I'm doing and keep fighting for the people that I'm fighting for, I'm going to get what I've uh, always been set out to uh, get. So with that being said, it's just like my whole, my whole mind frame and my whole mindset is on becoming a world champion and doing whatever it takes in order to get myself in position to fight for that belt. So there's a mentality shift there, are you saying? And if so, what was the what was the shift? Uh, well, the shift was to take it more seriously, become more disciplined, become damn near stoic, right? Where I was away from my family. Uh, everybody want to talk about Yuri Prohaska, but I was really on that same type of time, you know, in a dark room, by myself, alone, in my own head, right? Uh, allowing myself to uh, truthfully think about, you know, how can I change not only myself, but the game that's around me? Because I really feel like in mixed martial arts, in this, uh, in the industry alone, that people not doing it right. People, like not really um, trying to put anything in the game where they're trying to innovate. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't really want to go in depth with that because I ain't trying to help nobody out right now, mm -hmm. right, until mm -hmm. I become a world champion. And I feel like all the things that uh, I've been working towards and I've been doing is all being created from my mind and it's all has helped me towards my success at, at Welterweight. Mm -hmm. So you're into, you're into stoic philosophy? Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> who, who do you follow? Uh, so obviously everybody knows uh Marcus Aurelius, right? Mm -hmm. So my biggest thing is just uh understanding that the things that made man great man, they had to tap in into what they prime uh what what's the word I'm looking for? They purpose, right? Mm -hmm. What is your purpose in life? And the only way to find your purpose is to remove all things that's in front of you, right? The wants and the 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 flashy, you know, luxury, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The girls, all that type of shit, right? Remove everything away and find out what your true purpose is, what your true meaning is. And then guess what? Once you find that out, do everything uh in your breath to get it, mm -hmm. right? And to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Even if you put your life on the line. I love it. hundred percent. Okay. Couldn't agree more. Um you called out Gilbert Burns in the media room afterwards. I'm sure you've seen his response to your call out via via his podcast. If so, what what do you make of it? Uh, wait. So who? Gilbert Burns. Oh, uh, what about Gilbert Burns again? I'm Gilbert sorry. Burns respond responded to you on his podcast. He said, "Ah, uh, got you. Yeah, he might he might have responded, but uh, <laughs> he he has another fight. I don't think I I'm supposed to because I, I know exactly who it is, but okay. he has another opponent, and it's not me. Okay, um. Yeah. So if if it's not McGregor and it's not Gilbert Burns, then who's next? <laughs> uh, that's true. Uh, that's a good story, right? So they called me up with a name. Unfortunately, that name has moved on to somebody else. He wanted somebody else. That's good for him. Uh, so right now we just wait. So we waiting on a big name and a big call. Can I take a guess who the name was? Uh, sure. If you want. <laughs> Ian, Ian Gary. Three or three. Uh, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Nah. We actually declined Ian Gary. Because of time wise, because hmm. they wanted it on the same McGregor card, yeah. right? That would have been big, but you know, got my babies and stuff. Thought I'd kick it with them real quick. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, your call out to Conor McGregor has received a lot of flack online. I saw it the other day yeah. someone said it's the worst call out in UFC history, which I think is quite harsh. I have to be honest. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> picking okay. sides. That's quite harsh. But hey. uh, what have you made to the fan reaction? Because I, I know that it was tongue in cheek on your on your part, but what have you made? Exactly. 
Uh, I mean, it, it did exactly what it's supposed to do. It was supposed to get people emotionally invested. You know, everybody loves Conor McGregor, and he's the most beloved fighter of all time, obviously, right, because of what he did for the sport, as he should be one of. So I know that picking shots to him, I knew that Conor didn't have to say anything to me. It was going to be the fans, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as um, they were, you know what I mean, uh, enticed by it, and they was watching it, and they was clicking, and they was commenting, guess what? That just makes that video get more and more and more popular. Whether you call it the best or the worst doesn't matter to me because it's just your opinion. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's been countless of call outs that may not even be remembered, right? Yeah. So you can't even call mine the worst because you can't even remember those other yeah. call outs that even happened. But you will always remember the time that Joaquin Buckley, who the fuck is that guy called out, Conor McGregor? You know, and they always gonna say that shit. <laughs> yeah, because we always, how many times do we see a Michael Bisping or Joe Rogan ask somebody who they want next and they say anybody? And how many times do we see people say that that's the waste of a moment on the mic? Um, McGregor versus Chandler, three hundred three. Speaking of it, who do you who do you yeah. think comes out of international international fight week with the win? Uh, I mean that's a good question, you know, and it kind of looks, you know, fresh. He looks cool. Uh, he looks sober, <laughs> right? <laughs> he looks sober. Uh, leading up into this fight, um, Michael Chandler has always been a hard worker. He's always been a dog. Um, but I feel like you know, just technique for technique on the feet, and Michael Chandler acting like he's not going to be wrestling. He's going to be standing up with. Conor McGregor, if he does decide to do that, I can see Conor McGregor, man, spinning Michael Chandler around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a like a like a vinyl <laughs> record. Here. Let's go. Uh -huh. A couple more from me, uh, Buck, and as always, thank you for the time. Um, last time we spoke, you were handing out Leon, uh, Leon Edwards' missing posters. Yeah. The guy's been found, and he's now back at UFC 304 versus hey, we against, found him. Found against him. the guy that you wanted to see him fight in, Bilal Muhammad, mm -hmm. which I think the messaging of those posters was maybe mixed up. Some guys were saying that you, you were campaigning for the fight, whereas if you actually read the poster, you were campaigning for Bilal to get the fight. I was campaigning right. for Bilal, yes. So what is yes. your reaction to that fight? Being uh, I love it. Because the reason why I love it the most is because now the welterweight division can move on and it can do what it needs to do. As long as the champion is inactive, guess what? That means the whole roster is inactive because nobody has is going to be given the opportunity until the champ comes back out and fights. So with with Leon taking this fight with Bilal Muhammad, it just gets the you know welterweight division back active again. That's it. Why don't you try and get a t come over and watch the fight in Manchester? Come on, we'd love to have you. Like cage side, come on, hey, watch that fight. Uh, no, I would say okay. I would at least say this, right? I was supposed to fight Manchester, but the person moved on. MVP. I was supposed. To... <laughs> That's a real shame. That's a real shame, yeah. book. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. So, yeah. last question from me, and thank you for the time. Um, we're at the end of May. 2024 now where is Joaquin Buckley in his career come the end of May 2025 what are your goals for the next 12 month period uh that, that that's that's a real good question man uh I got a lot of things that I got prepared and that I'm working on but one thing that my grandmother has always shared with me anything that you got planned anything that you want to do keeping it silent and work towards it and then people will see exactly what you got coming once it comes out you know I love it well, listen, listen, it's always good to see you back in action, even better to see you get that win. I feel like we speak more than probably half of my family members these days. We're speaking all the time, which is always yeah, good. Yeah, so yeah. thank you for the time again, and I look forward to seeing you back in action soon. All right, man, appreciate you, Mike. Thank you, bro.